Okay, so um, let me just say hi and see everybody first. Um, so I'm going to gallery view, uh, and I'm not great at the technology here yet, so please bear with me. Um, so it's it's really nice to to see you all, and I'm excited to have some some questions and some discussion. What I'd like to do here is walk through. Um, my interpretation of the deposits that we've been seeing and then uh, and then take a deep what I'll call a deep dive into um, into the uh, sort of glacial history of this area and then how we can use that for under understanding what's happening with ice sheets today and I guess whatever I mean I think if you have questions and I'm and I'm not explaining something clearly please do interrupt me and ask. I'm, I'm happy for that. Otherwise, I'm happy to have more of a discussion and I will try really hard to save time. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is, is share my screen with you. So let me see if I can do this successfully. Um, there we go. Okay. Let's see if I can make this big. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Good. Thanks, great. Okay, so I'm gonna run through this, this PowerPoint presentation that, that has a bunch of slides that, that show different images that I think are helpful to understand this, but please again, just ask me um, questions along the way. So, so I'm a, a glacial geologist or quaternary geologist and, and um, I look at uh, these really relatively recent environments in the past about two and a half million years. Um, to understand primarily uh, the behavior of ice sheets and the behavior of, of glaciers and use these to um, understand past climate changes and then to also help us understand how ice sheets respond to climate change. So let's, let's dive into what we've seen. Um, these are two images to start with just from a textbook that I use. Hold on one second, it just started pouring rain. I'm gonna shut this off. From a textbook that I use, um, and on the upper left, what you see is an ice sheet and the environments and sediments that form around an ice sheet. And then in the lower right, what you see here is the, the landscape and the features on the landscape that can form after an ice sheet recedes or retreats, uh, melts away in an area. Um, so I wanna talk about the two landforms that we've seen. We've seen this, this ridge that's made of coarse sediment. And I said, this is most likely associated with a very fast flowing water, likely a, a fast flowing um, river stream. And in fact, what we think this is, is one of these streams that uh, flowed underneath an ice sheet. Um, and um, I mentioned in the video that you shouldn't believe me when I tell you that this ridge is actually a former stream because it's weird to have a stream not be in a channel, right? It should be a it should be uh, cut into the landscape rather than this topographic feature on the landscape. Well, in these in these ice sheets, it's possible to have, you've seen, actually, if we go back to this image, the, the water that, that flows on top of the ice sheet can be a, a huge amount of water that can cut through the ice itself down to the base of the ice and form a tunnel within the ice so that um, all those coarse sediments that you saw that make up in the ridge were, were being carried by water underneath the ice sheet by the stream. And then as the ice sheet recedes, each sort of step it takes back, it, it'll, it allows this water to, to stop transporting the sediment as fast. The sediment's deposited, but that sediment actually takes the form of that tunnel. Um, and that's, that's what we see in the image down on the lower right that is shown here, these ridges that are labeled what are called eskers and they're topographic highs they're they're long linear features and they're typically also parallel to the ice flow the former ice flow direction and that in in hanover was approximately north to south and so that's what um, the ridge that we walked on and we looked at is approximately north to south so the way that we interpret that is, is something called um, an esker and it marks this stream that existed beneath the ice sheet does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about that? So the so why is it that the sediment isn't just pushed out of the tunnel and onto the outwash? So it is, and um, I mean it, it it is pushed out, but as that it's sort of a, a transient 
forming feature. It forms over time. So as the ice sheet retreats, there is a little bit of sediment in that tunnel that can um, remain stationary as that part of the ice margin melts. Um, and it's sort of built up, they're almost called, in places they're called beaded eskers because they're like these little pods of sediment that are deposited as the ice sheet retreats. But it is, I mean, it's, it's an interesting feature because um, it's not something that we've seen deposited like in real time. It's really hard to see it deposited in real time. But when we look at the landscape across North America or across Sweden um, and Scandinavia, there are these long linear features that really resemble subglacial streams. And people are studying them really actively now because we want to understand how that plumbing works beneath an ice sheet. So it's another, it's an example of what people are trying to look at from the past to understand how ice sheets work today. Meredith, do you have any guess, and, and I realize it probably is to some level a guess, that how ephemeral that the streams would be to create like the Dartmouth Ridge that you actually walked, it, and as, as well as like even the volume of water. I mean, how big and how, you know, are we talking weeks and large? Are we talking months and small? So my guess is that um, the, is that it was a pretty permanent feature underneath the ice sheet. It, it basically parallels and it actually jumps back and forth across the Connecticut Valley. So somehow that um, subglacial drainage was taking advantage of the pre-existing topography it, because the Connecticut River Valley is a, a former rift, a failed rift. Um, so it's already a, uh, topographic low. Um, so my guess is that's a pretty permanent feature under the ice sheet, you know, permanent being at least a hundred, if not more than that years. And volume of water, I mean, there must have been a huge amount of water coursing through there. People probably have done some calculations of that. They haven't done it at, at that Hanover Esker. Um, the feature is actually really interesting. It extends almost 20 miles from north of Hanover to south of Hanover. So it's a, it's a very um, geographically extensive feature too. Okay. One other thing, so then it becomes a tunnel because you get snow in the following year that then forms ice over the... Probably, yeah, that has a lot to do with it. I mean, you're, you're in an environment where there's, I mean, that, that sediment is probably frozen in the winter, right? So it helps um, accumulate that and keep it sort of in a, in a sediment pile. That's a great point, Lee. Yeah. Did you have an age for this? Like, was it uh, the last uh, Wisconsin glaciation, like 15,000 years ago? Or? It was. It was the last Wisconsin glaciation. So, and that's the most recent glaciation, the one that ended around 20,000 years ago, or the ice sheet started to retreat around 20,000 years ago. And I'll get into how we know that. Okay. okay. That would be interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the other feature that we looked at is this Hanover Plain, the Hanover Green. And um, I'm going to use these images again. Um, so as you can imagine, as the ice sheets melt, there's a ton of water that comes off of them, right? Um, melt water um, from the warming climate melting the ice. And if there is a basin, a pre-existing topographic basin in front of that ice sheet, you can collect water and form a glacial lake. Um, and in fact, that's what occurred in this area at the end of the last ice age. The Connecticut River Valley is this great basin um, that collected river, uh, that collected um, water and the Hanover Green and many of the like New England greens that go run up and down the Connecticut River Valley are these for, or, or the former bed of this large lake. Um, and you can just see that in the lower right image that where the lake was in front of the ice sheet, there's a, there's a bed and in, in places, if there's a stream that actually emptied into that lake, you can see where there, there might be a delta that formed. So that's how we interpret this, this plain is that it's a, a lake bed that was a, a lake that existed as the ice sheet melted through the area. So let me give you some perspective on what that looked like. Um, there are deltas in the area. Um, there are obviously a lot of streams that sort of flowed in, flow in currently to the Connecticut River Valley. And at the time when the, this lake existed, uh, those streams flowed into the lake and, and formed deltas. And from those, we can estimate a, a, a former water level in that lake. And we estimate that that was just below this um, Baker Tower Library. And I can give you the exact elevation of that. Um, it was about, I believe it was about 600 feet elevation. So that's almost 100 feet of lake water. 
Um, and so this is my image just showing how the, what the Hanover Green would have looked like. And this is what I tell my students when I teach about this is that, you know, next time you walk to class, imagine walking across the green underneath this, this glacial lake. So below that Hanover or Dartmouth Plain, um, the green are sediments um, that, I, that are really interesting. And this gets into the question of how do we actually figure out the timing of things and the, the age of these things. So these sediments are, are, are what got edited out a little bit, but you saw one picture of them and I'll show some more pictures of them. Um, they're, they're very fine grain, they're, they're silts and clay and they're layered. And that's why I have sketched in these, these layers down here. And I'm gonna use this term to describe them that are called barves. And you may have heard of the term barve and I'll, I'll, I'll come, go on to define that. Um, so let's, oh, why am I not able to do this? Okay. Let's start just with this image. Um, so this is an image I took in Greenland a couple years ago and it shows the Greenland ice sheet um, and in this kind of environment where the ice sheet's melting, there's a basin in front of the ice sheet and there's a lake forming. So this is what I would call a proglacial lake. And the reason why I call it proglacial is because you can see here the edge of the ice sheet is actually in contact with the lake water. And this means the sediment that's being ground up underneath the ice sheet um, and transported within the ice is actually dumping right into the lake. Um, and this is really cool. So you, you may have seen in, in different places, like if you've ever looked at maps of like Glacier National Park or I mean Google images of Glacier National Park or other environments, Greenland, you see these lakes and they have this super cool color, right? It's like turquoise, it's beautiful. And the color is there because of the very, very fine grained sediment in the lake. So this is the silt and the clay that was ground up at the bottom of the ice sheet that's flushed out from the ice into the lake water and it stays in suspension, right? Because there's some waves in the lake, there's some currents in the lake and it's so fine grained that it stays into suspension until it can settle out. And when it settles out, then it can form these very, very fine uh, small sediments on the lake floor that can accumulate in layers. Is that clear to everybody? Do you have any questions about that? Okay. Um, so, so, so now I'm going to take a deep dive into these sediments and these sediments are one of my, f they're like my favorite thing in the whole world besides my kids. Um, but so these sediments that accumulate on a lake bed in this kind of environment where there's a proglacial lake are called varves. And this is what underlies Hanover. It's what underlies all of those plains around this area. And the definition of a varv is an annual sediment layer. So this is a sediment layer that we know as geologists represents one year of time, okay? And if we wanna further define that, we call it a glacial varv. And that means it's a sediment layer that is one year of time that forms in a proglacial lake. And the important thing about this is that the sediment that's delivered to that lake um, and that it eventually accumulates in that barb is controlled by um, meltwater from the ice sheet or from the glacier. So the reason we know that this is um, a year, the reason we believe that, that these layers are years is because they have this really characteristic color difference that you can see in the picture on the lower right. So that's a little hand sample outcrop that was dug out of an outcrop of varves. And you can see there are um, there's a gray layer and then a, a dark, I'm sorry, a dark gray layer and then a lighter gray layer and then a dark gray layer and then a lighter gray layer. And what those are, are those, those represent seasons. Um, so the dark layer, if we just take this one example, the very bottom layer here, that's almost all clay. Uh, and that clay is, can be deposited on the lake floor only during winter. Okay, and what it takes to deposit that clay, that's the finest grain size that there is. It's very, very fine sediment. And it typically stays suspended in the lake, like you see up here where the lake is, has that green color. That's because there's lots of clay suspended in the water. But during the winter on these lakes, there's lake ice cover and all of the meltwater from the glacier stops because it's winter and the glacier freezes. So it's a really super quiet water environment. And so you can get clay deposited. And then when the summer happens, the, the, that cover of lake ice melts 
and melting also starts on the ice sheet of the glacier. So you start washing sediment in and having different kinds of currents in the lake and that mixes up the lake water. So the clay stays in suspension, but the coarser material can get deposited. And that coarser material, what's floating out here in the lake is typically silt. So the lighter colored layer here is mostly silt. So together, the dark gray layer and the light gray layer are one year. There are a winter layer and a summer layer, okay? Okay, I went through that fast. So I wanna show another one of these images of barbs. And these things are so cool, right? This is a, this is a core through varve sediment that was taken in the upper valley. Um, and uh, you can see, I have some markings on here, <laughs> pointing at the screen. I'm not used to teaching online. I'm like, you can't see me. Um, so, so if you take a look at this core, we can talk through what I just talked through. So there's this dark layer that's all clay that was deposited in the winter. And then below it, there's this lighter layer that's silt, and that's what can settle out in the summertime. Um, and oftentimes in that, in that summer layer, you can see like multiple graded beds, which are probably like storm events or like melting events that are a flush of sediment from the glacier on, into the lake. Um, and together, these represent one year. There's some really cool things about here, these you can see too, like you can see on top of some of the winter layers, there's a very thin white layer. Do you see those? Whoops, I can go back. See those very thin white layers? That's like the spring flood. So that's very coarse, that's actually sand. And it's like when the, when the, when the lake ice breaks up and the glacier melt starts and all that snow on this that accumulated on the glacier during the winter starts to melt and gets flushed into the lake, that's that. So the, these layers that I'm showing you here are almost 14,000 years ago and we can see seasonal changes in them. To me, that's really cool. Yeah, Karen. Um, thanks. It's been a long time since I've taken geology, but so in your triangle, you've got sand, silt, clay. Why don't we see sand uh, in these kinds of layers? Yeah, Thank you. That's, a, that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit for that. So, so if we go back to this lake environment, you probably would have sand, but it's probably deposited right here, like near, like right at the edge of the glacier. Once that um, sand gets into the lake water, it just can't be transported very far, right? Because it has to have like a current or something to actually pick it up and transport it. The, the silt and the clay, they'll, they can be suspended for a while. Maybe fine sand you could get out here, um, but there are these cool things in some of these layers. Let me go back. Oh darn, I don't have it here. Um, can you see, no. So here, do you see in this picture of the virus, do you see that little red thing, pink thing? Everybody see that? That is a piece of rock. Um, so it's a lithology that is some kind of probably arcosic sandstone or something, um, a, a red sandstone, but um, that was transported by an iceberg. So that's like, you might hear of ice rafted de debris in ocean sediments, that's ice rafted debris in lake sediments, right? Because in this environment, if you go back here, you have these icebergs that come out and those can transport like sand or coarser grain material too, but it's a little bit of like, that would be an irregular sediment type in these deposits. Does that yeah. help? Yeah. Could I, could I ask a question too? Um, yeah. the, do they ever use the word varves when they're talking about sediment cores in the ocean? Yeah, um, there are really neat varves. So varve just means annual sediment layer. They are incredible varves from a place in a place in the ocean called the Cariaco Basin, which is off of Venezuela, um, which is a deep ocean basin, but it's affected by the trade winds. And so there's a seasonal change in the winds that causes a seasonal change in biological activity in the ocean surface. And that causes an annual sediment layer to form in that part of the ocean. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, I just had never heard, uh, the andrel geologists never used the word varv. This, I, first time I'd heard it was with you. So I just was wondering about that. <laughs> so it's probably, would it would be unusual to have it probably in a, in a glacial marine environment. 
Um, it's much more typical of sort of a glacier lake environment. Okay, thanks. All right, let me let me plow forward. So 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 I hope you're seeing this that that the these sediment layers are annual and they tie back into what you've been learning about with Eric um, and I'm, I'm I'm sure some of the other ice core scientists that that this is like nature's way of telling time and geologists love that because I mean I, otherwise I spend my life in the lab trying to figure out you know how to date things um, and so just like tree rings or just like ice cores these are recording time for us and that's so important to be able to look at how things change compare them with each other and look at rates of change um, can I ask okay. um, how you would distinguish this and you know, I haven't ever really looked at it, but in a floodplain, how would that differ in terms of what you'd see in terms of sedimentary deposits? I mean, obviously you're not getting flooding every year, but. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there are, there, when we look at these verbs, we look for an outcrop that has either like, like 50 or 100 layers at least of sediment to look for that repeatability. In a floodplain, I wouldn't, sort of expect to have that that repeatability over that sort of time sorry and um uh within this also um i think what's telling that that they're annual or that these are representing seasons is are, are that the summer layers have these multiple beds to them that are each um graded so they're individual events happening over and over. So it's not just a single event, it's not just a single graded bed, but it's multiple graded beds. And then there's this big change to, you know, or uh, it's actually a gradual change to winter. There's a slow transition into only clay and that the end of winter is really abrupt. And then it comes back to summer. And that's repeated just, you know, we look for that to be repeated many, many times. Um, so I think that that would be a big difference of, of saying these are actually annual layers. And initially, I mean, so this, there's an incredible history of this. Was, this work was started um, in New England, looking at VARBs in the 1920s. And there was a guy named Ernst Antebs who developed records from these and was putting together, using these, and I'll talk about this, to put together ice sheet retreat. And, and there was a professor at Yale who didn't believe him. And it sort of went against the ideas of what this professor at Yale um, was publishing at the time and he put this guy out of business the guy who developed these initial records and he the guy moved to Antebs moves to Arizona and started to studying like desert deposits it was tragic and and it was buried until like the 1980s when another professor picked it up and started looking at these records again and showed these are really annual layers and he did that by using radiocarbon dating and dating you know different layers and showing there's this amount of time and there are this many layers and um, in any case, there's a really, if you, if anybody wants that history, I can show you how to access that history. It's, it's a very cool story about like the history of science. What was the guy who got pushed out? What was his name? His name is Ernst, um, E-R-N-S-T, Antebs, A-N-T-E-V-S. And he was a Swedish student who came over to study and then ended up staying. And he mapped, like he, he measured, um, I'll get into this, like, 5,000 years of barbs in New England on horseback and published something in two years. I tell my students, like he, he never slept. He must have been on some kind of like amphetamine. <laughs> like he, you know, he, this guy did an incredible amount of work and, and then, and then anyway, so, okay. Okay, so let me get into how this can be, how, why these are so cool and how they're like ice core records and tree ring records in a way. Um, so in this next slide, um, what are shown are two of the same image. Um, and in this slide, actually, you can see these drop pellet or the drop class. Those are the IRD, the, the ice rafted debris that, that I was talking about. And you can see the, the dark layers and the light layers and the dark layers and the light layers. So those are the summer and the winter layers on the left hand side. In the right hand image here, you can see these actually measured off. So the red lines mark um, the bottom of the summer layer, and the blue lines mark the bottom of a winter layer and the, the red line marks the bottom of the next summer layer. So this is um, what a professor at Tufts University, Jack Ridge, and all of these links are to his incredible website about this, that have all of these images. Um, he, he's developed a computer program that goes in and actually measures VARBs and, 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 and uh, sort of tuned it to, to really work well. 
And then from this program, or even by eye before this program, you can measure the thickness of a year. Okay, and that's how these what are called VAR records are, 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 are formed. And by VAR record, I mean what's here shown on the, on the far right. So that's a plot of year. So that's just annual year um, with no time scale on it yet, um, with the, the oldest at the bottom at the youngest at the top, and then VAR thickness on the x axis. And so you measure this, count this as, as one year and measure the thickness, thickness of it in centimeters and plot that. So that's one year is, let's say it's, you know, with, I don't know, there's just no scale in here, centimeter thick. The next one's a half a centimeter thick. So you see these changes in VAR thickness over time, right? And what these changes represent are a couple of things. The, the VAR thickness is basically telling you how much sediment is getting into that lake. And that can be either be because of how close the ice sheet is to that site, so if the ice sheet's closer, the varves are going to be really thick. If the ice sheet's way far away, the varves are going to be thinner. It's just proximity to the sediment source. And then the other thing that the thicknesses is telling you is how much melt there was on the ice sheet. So some of these really thick layers can mean there was a really, really warm summer and there was a lot of melt on the ice sheet. And some of the thinner layers tell you, oh, it might have been a colder summer there was less melt on the ice sheet. So these can start being used to, to tell things about climate. Is that okay for everybody? Okay. Um, okay, so, so what's been done by um, Jack Ridge, a professor who's worked extensively on this, who's at Tufts University, he's gone through and, and developed these, these records of ARBs, and I'll come back and talk about those um, and how they're used in, in the Hanover area. Um, let me take one more step here. Um, I'm trying to forward this, there we go. So the other thing that's really cool about VARVs, and this applies to what we've seen directly, um, is that in places you can find um, an outcrop in the environment where you can see VARVs directly on glacial till. Um, glacial till is sediment deposited directly below the ice sheet. What we didn't get to see, there's no outcrop that shows it, but we can infer it in the Hanover area is that we had varves that were directly on top of the esker. So the esker was the ice, the stream, represented the stream beneath the ice sheet. And as soon as that, so that's an environment that was beneath the ice sheet. As soon as the ice sheet receded, there's a lake in front of it. And in that lake, that's where the varves are deposited. So the esker came first, and the lake or the varves came second. Okay, I can't show you that because I don't have an outcrop on campus that shows that. If I could get out on the golf course with a backhoe, I would, but they would fire me probably. Um, so in this outcrop, what it sh what it shows is till, which is sort of our esker sediment in a way. It's the subglacial sediment overlain by varves. And so this contact here between till and varves, that shows the moment that the ice sheet receded through the area, right? Because this environment down here with the till or the esker is below the ice, and this is now in front of the ice. Everybody good with that? So this is a cool contact because this is telling us about what time when the ice sheet receded, okay? Everybody good with that? Okay. okay. How much time do I have, Bill? <laughs> You're muted. Can you okay. say that? I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes. I was muted. You were getting close, um, and I know Mary's on now. She follows you, so um, okay. when, whenever the next couple of minutes would be great. Okay, okay. so let me let me do this sort of big picture overview. And then if anybody wants more information, I'm happy to talk more about this or send you the slide bank and send you some of my references. So, so this is what North America looked like at the end of the ice age. This is the, the Laurentide ice sheet covered most of North, North America. It covered our area, New England, New York, down to here, Long Island, Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, those islands. Um, 
and I guess the question that, that these sediments help us answer is, is why did this ice sheet retreat? How did an ice sheet retreat? And how fast did it retreat? Um, and so the environments that we've been looking at are, um, are shown, at least uh, in the Hanover area, are shown in this map on the right, and that's the image that is represented by this red box on the left. It, it's a, a black and white image that shows the sort of eastern United States. So this is Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York. And this is the Hudson Valley. This is the Connecticut Valley. And this is the Merrimack Valley. I know a lot of you are not familiar with this geography. Hanover sits about here, right in between New Hampshire and, and Vermont on the Connecticut Valley. So at the end of the last ice, sheet, ice age, as this ice sheet retreated, there were these lake basins that formed that were the, the river basins um, or the river valley. So there, there are depressions on the landscape. And what happened was that the ice sheet deposited sediments that actually formed dams in these river valleys at the end of the last ice age. And those sediment dams blocked the flow of water through the valley and they form these, these lakes. So the hatched lines here show the extent of a large lake that filled what we'll focus on the Connecticut Valley at the end of the last ice age. So that is the, the lake in which these varves were deposited. And um, in places all throughout here, uh, Jack Ridge and others have been able to find um, outcrops that show this contact of till on uh, overlain by varves. And that, as I mentioned, is, is that the time of ice sheet retreat. So if we can find that at a couple locations in here, we can do something that is a really neat thing to do with varves is we can take, for example, um, outcrops here shown as A, E, and H. These are outcrops that would have varves directly over subglacial sediment till or esker or something bedrock even. And we can plot those up as a location and then use varves from other records, from other locations to tie these together. And, and I, I have glossed over this, but you can correlate varv records from different locations using that plot of year versus thickness. The same way you can think about these as like being tree rings. So if you have tree rings of different age, you can hook them up by thickness, right? You guys have worked through this, thought about this. Um, and in that way, we can tie together, at least even without any absolute ages, a, a, a time of, of how the ice sheet retreated through this valley, okay? Um, and then if we can come in here and let's say radiocarbon date some of these varves, we can could put an actual chronology on this y axis here, this time axis. And that has been done. Um, so I'm going to make a big leap here to a very confusing plot and um, just show an example of how these varve records and how these outcrops of varves on subglacial sediment have been used. So bear with me I'll, and I'll, I'll stop after this. We can break after this. Um, so if you look at the x-axis, this is distance up the Connecticut River Valley. So zero is, um, is Glastonbury, Connecticut, okay, which is sort of middle, middle of Connecticut state um, in the Connecticut River Valley. And then um, to the right goes 360 kilometers up north in that valley, and that covers all the way up through Hanover, okay? So what's on the y-axis is a bunch of different numbers, and, and these are numbers of how the VARV records were initially numbered, actually by Antebs, um, who just put like an arbitrary number on them, um, starting at, oh God, I believe 2800, and then Jack Ridge has gone lower than that. So these are just arbitrary years. Um, and those have since been translated into radiocarbon years, which are over here on this and this y-axis. So the timing on this is 18,400 years ago at the, at the lower end of the y-axis, going all the way up to 13,000 years ago, 13,200 years ago. And what can be done is you, you, you have that moment of, of deglaciation, that moment of ice recession when you have varves overlaying till 
or subglacial sediment. And those have been plotted here in terms of location on, and distance up the Connecticut Valley here. Here, so we're up, this is uh, Turner's Fall. This is up in Massachusetts. You can see the breaks between the states here. So this is getting up into New Hampshire and Vermont. Hanover's right about here. And because the VARs represent year, we can put time on that. Um, so we can look at how the ice sheet retreated through the valley over time, and we can look at ice uh, at ret rates of ice retreat. So we can see here down in the southern Connecticut Valley near Hartford, ice retreat rates were about 50 to 100 meters a year. Here is Springful Springfield, Massachusetts, Holyoke, Massachusetts, through Massachusetts. That actually, ice retreat rates slowed down a little bit, so 30 to 40 meters per year. Crossing the, uh, uh, the Massachusetts into the New Hampshire-Vermont borders, um, ice retreat rates speed up a little bit. And then just south of Hanover in this, in this area of Charlestown and Claremont, New Hampshire, the ice sheet just takes off. Something changed in the climate and caused this ice sheet to go you know, to, from about 100 meters a year to 300 meters a year retreat. So this is neat. This is a way that we can tell on a very, very high res time resolution rates of ice retreat. And then we can go into climate records and I'll just do that here. This is, you might have, be familiar with this. Mary certainly knows. This is the, the uh, Greenland ice core record showing temperature here on the, on the um, Y axis and time on the X axis. And, and there's, this, there's this rapid warming here at about 14,000 years ago. And if we go back to here, this is about, this change, this inflection point in ice retreat rates is about 14,500 years ago. So we think that this really major retreat, increase in ice retreat rate, sorry, is related to this climate warming. Okay, so I'll stop there. This just gives you a taste of like how we go from looking at outcrops on the Dartmouth campus to putting together longer records of how the ice sheet changed and then being able to use those and understand ice retreat rates and compare them with climate records. I'd be happy to provide more information about it, but I also want to give you a time for questions if there is that still. Yeah, As you are observing sediment, um, do you see all the fossil? Um, are there anybody working on the fossil records? Yeah, that's a great question. So there were, um, there are fossils in these lakes there. That's how, well, let me see if I have this in here. Um, in these sediments there, that's how they're radiocarbon dated. This shows some of the material that's been used to radiocarbon date the sediment. There are leaves in here. Um, these are, these are dryas leaves and arctic willow. This is a vaccinium, which is a blueberry leaf. These are, um, over here, these are deer poop that are preserved in the sediments. Um, and there are also, there are like fish scales, there are ostracods, and there are, if you can find actual plane where you can peel off the, the bed of the sediment, there are fish trails from the fins in the sediment. It's really cool. Yeah, great question. Yeah, hi. Is it possible to get a copy of these uh, slides that you're presenting? Of course, and I'm hoping that we will have this, that I can do this ag again and, and video it, um, so you'd have a video and then I can provide the slides. The other thing I would recommend, and I'll put it certainly at the end of these slides, sorry, let me see if I can get back to this, is um, these are my references. So this uh, Jack Ridge, who's at Tufts University, has an incredible project on glacial varves and deglaciation in the area, and he has a wonderful website that you can access here that has all of these images ready to download. It has data sets, um, bar records that you can plot up and try to correlate, look at changes over time. Fantastic. So it's a really accessible data set. Thank you. And Dominic, just so you know, um, Layla and um, Lauren are both working to upload all of the uh, presentations. And Meredith, if you could put yours in that folder that okay. we gave you access to the Google folder, they'll link it to your agenda. So every day we're trying to keep updated with the recordings and the PDFs to activities and the scientist presentations. So you should be able to get all of these resources. I just have, I just have a question about fish scale. Speaking on the fish scale, can we date the fish scale? Um, 
yes, I actually, I don't know with fish scales. I, I don't know how much carbon is in them for dating. I, I don't know what fish scales are made of. I they, would have, imagine. they have a lot of ketones. Chitin, yeah. Because um, I found, I found a, a lot of fish scales in, in the core uh, cord samples, sediment samples. And I was wondering if, if, we, can, uh, if we can date them. So y you, you might be able to. What's been used to date these sediments because there is the opportunity to do it is terrestrial macrofossils. And, and when you're, what, what, what I mean by that is plants that grow on land. Um, rather than anything that lives in the water because of the potential for a reservoir effect associated with the dating. Um, particularly in these glacial lakes that are covered by lake ice in the winter, you can have not a great exchange of carbon from the atmosphere into the lake water. So you may have an age that's a, a little bit erroneous if you're dating something that's actually getting its carbon from the water. So what Jack Ridge has done is really made an effort to date plants that are can be identified as growing on land and that, that have then subsequently washed and in, into the into the lake and fragile plants like little leaves so you know that they didn't persist for a long time on the landscape before they got washed into the into the lake okay thank you well let's give meredith a round of applause <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I hope you're having fun. Yeah. Hi, Mary. It's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Phil. Thanks so much what? for your efforts putting this all together. Yeah, I'll I'll fix I'll fix that glitch before we put it up live. I got some other things to talk to you about. So. Okay. Good. Thanks uh, for all the work.